Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are now moving through the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman's classic. We are in starting from Pominock section number five of the 19 sections of this, uh, of this uh, long poem um, called Starting from Pominock. Now, here, I, this, this is an amazing little passage that we're going to look at. Whitman is the new reformer. We're going to hear a lot about Luther. And for the first time, several of you have been saying, when is he going to finally mention Robin Williams and that 1989 classic Dead Poets Society, one of the more important films in the history of Whitman in film, and certainly, of course, our love of Robin Williams has been much chronicled and spoken of in room 303. Here, though, today, in this lecture, we will finally address the great text, Dead Poets Society. And, of course, many students were first turned on to Walt Whitman and his classic Leaves of Grass by virtue of some of that uh, information that happened in, that great in those great classroom scenes when, uh, you know, Keating, the great poet, teacher, is there in front of the lads. Um, now, here, just for a moment, before we get into the Section 5 poem, I just want to make sure that we're familiar with LearnStrong.net and the assumptions on the part of my lecturing here that you have been working with us, especially through the 24 poems of inscriptions and then finally through the intro lecture for starting from Pominock up through lecture for section number four. I have provided that link of the intro lecture there in the descriptions. If you haven't watched that, I recommend that you do that quickly and then come back to join us. Now again, our hopes are that you have the poem in front of you starting from Pominock, passage number five. My hope is always that you read this stuff on your own, just like we said in our discussions of the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Milton's Paradise Lost, Dante's Divine Comedy. You read it, then you come to me for some kind of help. Annotate it yourself, and then we'll go to work with it. Well, with that in mind, let's now go to passage five, and of course we will begin with Dead Poets. Notice, by the way, and we'll say this in more detail in a moment, but notice how brilliantly crafted this whole little poem section is. We'll begin with death and we'll end with a mistress and, of course, the soul. So we'll have some, some more to say about that. Passage 5. Dead poets, philosophs, priests, martyrs, artists, inventors, governments, long saints. Language shapers on other shores, nations once powerful, now withdraw reduced, withdrawn, or desolate. I dare not proceed till I respectfully credit what you have left, wafted hither. I have pursued it, own it is admirable, moving a while among it. Think nothing can ever be greater, nothing can ever deserve more than it deserves, regarding it all intently a long while, then dismissing it. I stand in my place with my own day here. Here, Lance, female and male. Here, the heirship and heiress ship of the world. Here, the flame of materials. Here, spirituality, the translatress, the openly avowed, the ever-tending, the final of visible forms, the satisfier after due long waiting, now advancing. Yes, here comes my mistress, the soul. And by the way, just to notice that anaphoria that we will point out later, but notice that repetition of here, here, here. We've got something going on in passage 5 that we do not want to miss. No question, this is going to be a radical moment already in Leaves of Grass. There, there's a good argument to be made that Passage 5 of starting from Pominock is really the beginning of the iconoclasm that will be Whitman's iconoclasm. Granted, we've seen it, of course, in the 24 poems of inscriptions, but boy, oh boy, here we're going to see some amazing stuff happening. Some will call, of course, what Machiavelli does, as we've talked about it in Learn Strong Lectures at LearnStrong.net, what Machiavelli does from Plato, the great break in the prince, right, to move away in the Renaissance from that classical tradition. We're going to have a break here. So in some ways, Whitman is playing around with Machiavelli, he's playing around with Luther, and of course, to some degree as well, we'll get into it. We're going to see this break that will be Emerson and an Emersonian break from Europe and the European tradition. 
We begin, of course, with dead poets. And yes, of course, we will pay our tribute here to the Dead Poets Society. The film, the 1989 classic, really it is a classic of Robin Williams. Some argue it's the greatest work he ever did. Certainly it was a great tribute to the iconoclastic kind of way that you can instruct and especially the use of Whitman. Notice the use of philosophs, which is this French kind of, uh, of word. Um, that is to say, philosophers. This is the variant, the French variant that Whitman often will use. Go back to stanza 18 and uh, of Eidolons and notice how philosophs and priests are put together. So here's that tension that we're talking about in, in, in stanza 18 of Eidolons takes us back to Homer and the Odyssey when Odysseus is standing there in front of a poet and a priest and decides to lop off the head of the priest and to keep the head of the poet on. Here it's not a poet, it's the philosophs because we've already mentioned the dead poets in the previous listing. By the way, notice there's about eight of these. Whitman loves, again, this listing kind of things. Martyrs, of course, we have to think about the great religious martyrs of all time. We are going to think, of course, about Luther to some degree. Artists, notice somehow different but the same as the dead poets, inventors, governments long since. So we're, 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 we're pointing backwards, right? And then language shapers. Now, I want to point out how Whitman loves this creating of two words uh, into one word, right, with the hyphen. Notice how he will do this all the way through uh, Leaves of Grass. But notice here, uh, we're going to see it a couple of times, three times in this poem right now language shapers, and that's in large measure, that's exactly what the great ones do. I mean, we've talked about how incredible it is that Shakespeare invented so many words, that Milton invented so many, uh, you know, neologisms. And here, this is why we say in 303, we're always wanting to play in the fields of language, a line like this. Language shapers on other shores. So obviously we're talking about Europe here, to pri primarily to Europe. Although, put it in your notes at 3A, we'll be thinking as well about passage to India as we mess around with this. In other words, that which is ancient, right? Nations once powerful, right? Think about our Plato's Republic and the declension of state lectures that we've given, uh, and that whole notion of why it is the case that uh, nations will begin and then they will ascend, and then there's that political looking over the shoulder and beginning to assess some kind of golden age when things used to be so much better, now not so much. Now reduced, withdrawn, desolate. Where are we talking? England? Where, are we talking France? What are, what are we speaking here? Obviously we're talking Europe, right? In other words, there was a time. And then he uses that interesting verb dare. I dare not proceed till I respectfully credit what you have left wafted hither. Notice here the you, then, is to speak to the dead poets of Europe, right? That is to say, the, obviously, our classic dead white males list, right? From Homer through Virgil to, of course, the list goes on. Dante to Chaucer to Shakespeare to Milton and the like, right? Notice he says, I want to be respectful. I want to credit what you have left. And then it's an interesting verb, wafted hither, like smoke or smell, right? I have pursued it, right? That is to say, this whole notion of how one peruses to pursue, to study. We've seen this in earlier beginning my studies. I pursued, I perused it. Own believe, in other words, it is admirable. In other words, I'm taking nothing away from the old stories. And as, of course, we say in 303, many times we are the stories we tell and retell. Well, the stories we decide to accept are also the stories we decide to reject, and so here it comes. Get ready for it. I have perused it, own it is admirable, and then in parentheses, notice his use again of the parentheses, moving a while among it. In other words, this self-taught genius, right, in Whitman. I mean, he didn't have, after the age of 11, he never had any formal education again in his life, and yet very, very well read, and he says, I've spent time uh, moving a while among it think nothing can ever be greater, nothing can ever deserve more than it deserves. We're certainly, in rhetorical language, conceding a point here. We are saying, we are admitting, nothing greater than the great poets, the dead poets who came before, the nations that produced them, right? But then after he says that, he says, regarding it all intently a long while, in other words, 
I'm not getting rid of this project so flippantly. And here, obviously, he's sounding like uh, you know Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Prudence indeed long dictates that nations so established, blah, 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 blah. In other words, that conceding of a point will always seem to follow with the word but or some sense of it. He uses the word then. After all of the things that he's said in those previous lines about how amazing the poets are of Europe, the artists, the innovators, the governments, he says, I'm ready to dismiss it. And then sounding very much like Luther in that 1521 famous statement, I stand here and can't do otherwise from, of course, the, the Diet of Worms. He says it this way, I stand in my place with my own day here. There are few lines that are as iconoclastic and as powerful for Emerson as a line like this. It will be Emerson who asks, an American scholar, in any number of the poet, any number of other essays, go back and look at our lectures at LearnStrong.net on all of those Emerson essays. Notice how many times he kept asking that question. Where is the one, the voice, the poet, who will take us out of the shadow of Europe and we can stand on our own in our own day? In other words, we, America, have arrived. This is Walt Whitman proclaiming it. And in some ways... We're no longer in the inscriptions. We're no longer in the invocation of the muse. We are now in the declaration of a new day. And you can almost hear the language, right, of Shakespeare's Tempest, Brave New World, as he plays this game in starting from Pongon. He says it. Here is the way he finishes that stanza. And now we'll have the repetition of five, six, maybe even seven of these here's it's almost as if he's pointing again and again. Notice this poem is directed to Europe and European readers, right? Here, lands, and now notice the inclusivity of his language. Female and male, notice he begins with female. Here, the heirship and heiresship of the world. And again, we start to think about passage to India later when we get ready to study that. Here, and then of course the important symbol of fire, the flame of materials. Notice how he comes back from wafted to flame. Do you see this? This is genius the way he's constructing this. In other words, you guys started the fire, now here we are. Borrowing heavily from that word picture at the conclusion of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind where he says, I just want that ember to be picked up and driven across the universe to start a new fire. Here is that fire. Here we have Shelley coming full bloom into Whitman. Whitman very much seeing what Shelley starts, I will, I will finish, right? Here he says, the flame of materials. And then here, taking us back to our Luther, spirituality, the translatress. Notice he uses the feminine language. The spirituality that will translate for us what all this means. We're going to get to the soul as a mistress in a second. Notice all the feminine language that gets used. The openly avowed, notice the alighted uh, verb here of avowed. Notice again this use of the hyphen to create two, out of two words, one word. The openly avowed, again it's open. We're not, we're not trying to hide anymore in the shadows. The ever tending, again two words that are hyphenated to create one word. The ever tending and then the final. Now there is, there is a French spelling of this in one of the older, in one of the older but this is the actual fi uh, uh, finale here is it. The finale of visible forms. Obviously, when you hear the word forms, you think of your Plato's Republic, especially book six and seven and form theory and the cave allegory. Go back to our comments on um, um, of that at learnstrong.net, uh, as well as um, Idolins and our comments there in the in the uh, in the earlier poem from uh, from the inscriptions passage. This use of the word forms is going to play on so many levels. Think about the way that Wordsworth uses that word forms in his poem, Tintern Abbey. Think about Whitman's 1802, London 1802, where he calls to Milton and he says, we need you now. That sense that there's something wrong in England and in English letters, Milton is gone. Here, notice, it's Whitman that maybe is speaking to Wordsworth and saying, we'll take care of it from here. Here, the visible forms, the finale of the visible forms. The satisfier, there's an interesting word. That, in other words, there's been this long, long urging in the West, in Europe, to try and come to fruition, and here it is finally coming to fruition. After due, 
long waiting, again, two words that create one word, long waiting, now advancing. And then the word yes. Now I want you to pay attention to the way the word yes gets used. Of course, Joyce will play that game in his, in his novel Ulysses. This yes, this affirmation, yes, and then one more here. Here comes my mistress, the soul. Now, we cannot think about this notion of mistress and without seeing all this feminine language. And of course, here we've got some sexual language. It is interesting, of course, to ask about Whitman, his views on sexuality, his own sexuality as Whitman is, as, uh, as person. We obviously will have to get into this as we get into Leaves of Grass. And there's huge debate about this among Whitman scholars. Is Whitman, in fact, asexual through most of Leaves of Grass? Is he homoerotic? I mean, to what degree is, are, are we able to read these kinds of lines? Mistress here, and how does it get used? But notice, it's the soul that is the mistress. We'll come back to this, obviously, in Song of Myself. I told you guys, we're learning how to read this information so that we can read Song of Myself here in a while. Here it all comes, the fruition of it all, some sexual language, no question, no question that we're going to play around with this word comes. We've seen this word, the very first word you'll remember of leaves of grass is the word come, and we're going to see it over and over again. It's an invitation. Sometimes it will be sexual. We're going to see this. Whitman will use this. Guys, guys, there's a reason why Whitman is such an iconoclast for his day. He remains in some ways an iconoclast because what is it that he's arguing? Everything that's ever happened in Europe leads to America. That's what all the dead poets were gesturing towards. This is the penultimate. This is the coming ultimately to its ultimate fruition. Later in the Leaves of Grass, we're going to hear sexual language that actually begins to start to sound like some kind of sexual climax. We're going to hear that kind of language. That is, of course, somewhat radical in its own right. We're certainly going to see it here as well, right? So notice... We start with dead poets and we end with a living soul. And this, of course, is the excitement that will finish. It's interesting, some readers have pointed out how he doesn't use an exclamation mark in this poem here. And yet it is clear what he's saying with the word yes is, yes, here it is, finally, at long last, after all of the years of waiting, here finally we are. Let's finish it 2A. And that's it, right? It is. Move over Europe. America's arrived. After studying, he says, all the old and the European ways, I'm going to reject that story, we will reject that story, or, again, the language of the integralist philosophy, transcend and include. We are moving beyond it. The European ways are the old ways. We have the new ways of looking. And, of course, here the language is profound. At to be, the repetitions, notice all the hears. Notice the symbolism, starting with dead poets and ending with the mistress, which is the soul. At 3a, and how are we going to relate this to other texts? Well, I mean, there's just so many. I mean, obviously he's referencing everything from Plato and Homer and the Greek poets, uh, um, dramatists and Aristotle, through Virgil, of course, to, yeah, right, Dante, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, and all the rest of them. In other words, all of the greats were moving beyond them. We're moving through them and beyond them to the new mistress, the soul. Wow. Now, there are other titles we can throw here. I mean, I mentioned Luther in his, in his 1521 Imperial Diets uh, of Worms statement, right? Um, but I want to mention as well some of the important thinkers of the 20th century. Think about how Tilly Olson in her classic silences, we speak regularly about it, how she, along with so many early feminist thinkers, were ready to play the same exact game. That is to say, we've listened to the dead white males long enough. Now we're ready to move on. You can't silence us anymore. Think about how profound that is, or any of the iconoclasts, right? From Ginsburg on down the line. Anytime you find an iconoclast, they're ready to say, you know, we appreciate what you've done. Now, stand aside, let us take over. And to that degree, that's why we love to read somebody like Amanda Gorman's The Hill We Climb, that great poem that was, that was read and recited by her uh, at the president's inauguration. Why? Because there you hear it again, that spirit of Whitman that says, we're going to move on, we're going to move beyond you. And it's not that we're rejecting, it's just, notice how he says it respectfully, we're just ready to move on. It's compelling stuff. Finally at 3B. It's uh, so many ways that you can try to relate this to yourself, right? For example, why, question, why is it you think so hard for the old to watch the new 
replace it. I mean, go back to what Tennyson, uh, Tennyson says in his poem Ulysses. This is my son, my own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter in the aisle. Go back and see what we have to say about those lines. In other words, the young have to take over from the old. Why is it so hard for the old to kind of watch that happen? And finally, your thoughts. Which is greater? The dead poets of the old or the new ones? Or is there some, some, some kind of beautiful symbiosis as we prepare now for passage six? And we'll get on into this poem in truth. Thank you.